Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about seed saving. I'm walking backwards through the grocery row garden. I've been in the spice rum and I'm making my pregnant wife try to balance a tripod on her shoulder to get this amazing shot because I've been watching these cinematography channels. And here we go through the garden. Everything's going fine. It looks awesome. I'm totally out of focus now. There's no way that I'm in focus. Is that focus like infinite? That mic's going to run into that thing. And then we don't crash into this. And I see, I'm walking backwards because it's supposed to be that I'm walking through the garden and it looks really cool. It's like the BBC presenter. In a garden, there's all kinds of plants. But if I actually did it like walking forwards, my wife would trip. So I'm cruel, but I'm not that cruel. Run the fountain. A few weeks ago, my friend Noah Sanders, who wrote the book Born Again Dirt, he has a, uh, a larger skull, like a high skull capacity, very smart. You can tell by his forehead. It's, it's one of those things you want to look for when, when you are paying attention to people. What size is their forehead? My forehead is huge. Gigantic. Actually, the back of my skull goes very, very far. I don't, probably you can't really see it on camera, but like in real life, massive skull capacity. So he asked me, are you saving seeds? Are you saving seeds? And I started thinking about it. Yeah, we generally save some seeds. We don't save a ton of seeds, like we don't save our broccoli seed. You know, we don't save cabbage seeds. But there are a lot of things that are really simple and easy to grow from seed that you can grow again and again and again and again. So today, I'm going to give you some seed saving basics and we'll look at a few plants that are super easy to save provided you know the tricks to make sure that they're not crossing and giving you something that you didn't expect. These beans that are right behind me, these yard long beans, these are super easy. We'll talk about beans first. Beans are one of the easiest seeds to save. And that is because they are an inbreeder. And usually they are that they are a self-pollinator. So those things go together. They you can have one bean, right? One bean in the bottom of a package. You could take that one bean and plant it. Save all those seeds. Plant them out. They're gonna be like that bean you originally planted some almost lost variety of bean, right? And you just go ahead and you plant them all back again. You could bring whole new generations, years and years and years into the world based on the genetics of one bean. Beans don't need to cross pollinate out in order to maintain their vigor. They basically are just what they are and they continue. Now there are occasional changes and mutations and cross breeds that take place, but generally, you could plant multiple varieties of beans next to each other and save the seeds and you'll get the same type that you planted even though they were right next to each other. They're not that interested. They are beans going their own way. They just continue. And that makes them a prime candidate for seed saving. The key to actually saving the seeds themselves is just let them dry on the plant let them dry out, let the pods dry. They go past the green bean stage and right onto the paper pod. And then on a nice dry day, harvest them off. Take them indoors, let them continue to dry in the pods until they're really nice and papery and they just wanna break open easily. If you have an air conditioned house, it's very helpful. If you have a very humid house, mm, dry them at room temperature as best as you can, but if you have a dehydrator or something like that, it helps. You want the moisture to get down a little further. And then once they're nice and dry on the counter, it's usually a couple of weeks, shell them out of the pods, let them sit another week or two on the counter, and then they're ready to be bagged up and stuck in the fridge. This particular variety of noodle bean or snake bean, asparagus bean, yard long bean, it's got a bunch of names. This particular one, is a sport. I got some beans, just a package of beans, and I planted them. Most of them came out a dark pod. One of the plants 
had very pale green pods, which I found made them easier for picking. They, I thought they had a little nicer texture too. Now that bean may be a mutation, it may have been one that got mixed into the packet, but what I did was I saved the seeds just from those earlier in the year. They were the first round of spring beans and I said, that plant right there, I want those beans again. That's gonna be Dave's pale green noodle bean. You know, pale green asparagus, whatever. That variety there, I want in my garden more than I want the dark green variety. I like that it's so easy to spot against the usually dark green leaves. So I planted seeds from those pods on this trellis and on a second trellis. And guess what? Every single one of these beans was a pale green. They didn't cross and like go back to being dark green or whatever. Generally, you get what you get when you plant a bean. They don't, they don't split off very easily. So beans are super easy to save. You wanna grow five varieties of beans and save the seeds. You don't have to worry about them crossing all up. Now, there are some other plants that you do have to worry about crossing. Let's look at one of those next. These reticulated Brazilian squash are super easy to save seed from. This is a Cucurbita pepo. This is your summer squashes, including the vile green summer squash, which shall not be named. This originally was green, but now it's bright yellow. That's because it is ripe. The outside of it is hard. This is beyond the point where you would harvest it for the table. These things are not particularly good when they are like this. Like they're, they're not edible. I mean, they're not edible in general, but they're definitely, definitely not edible right now because they're too hard. I mean, you could turn around, I guess, and bake them or something if you were really starving, but this is not culinary stuff right here. This is seed saving. Cucurbita pepo. There's a lot of pumpkins and summer squash underneath the species Cucurbita pepo. And it's important to know this because these are outbreeders. They like to cross-pollinate like crazy. So if you were growing, say, Connecticut field pumpkin, the big orange ones that they grow uh, for Halloween, say you got some of those. Oh, wouldn't it be fun to plant some of those? Yeah. Cucurbita pepo, but you've got yellow crookneck squash. Your yellow crookneck squash and the Connecticut field pumpkins can actually cross with each other. So if you save seeds, you don't know what you're gonna get. Now, like I've said before, the fruit is from the mother. It looks like the mother. It's the mother's belly. The seeds are the little baby in the mama's belly. So. If they cross, you don't know it until you plant these seeds and the next generation you see what you get. You won't suddenly have, you know, orange crooknecks that are getting big globular fruits. It's not gonna work that way. You won't know it until you plant these seeds. Now, the closest pepo that I had were some pepita squash, which is the hullless pumpkin seeds, a variety called kakai. And I got that from Baker Creek Seeds, I think. That was about 400 feet over that way. So hopefully they didn't cross with these reticulated whatever they are. So these seeds should be good, but bees can get around. So if you plant these seeds and they start making a fruit that doesn't look anything like the fruit you remember, you've got to cross and then you've got a point. You got you got a choice at that point. Are you gonna rogue it out, which means get rid of it because it looks different and you don't know what it's gonna be and you, but you know it's not the thing you wanted to save, save seeds from, or are you gonna just let it grow and see what you get? I had a spaghetti squash cross with an acorn squash once. The next generation that grew out of the compost pile, I just let them grow to see what happened 
and I had what looked like pretty much like a normal acorn squash, except it was spaghetti squash flesh inside. So it did cross, definitely, and it was a little different, and I could have said, you know, that's Dave's spaghetti acorn. If I had wanted to grow that out for a few years and get rid of everyone that didn't look like that and just maintain that variety and breed it out and cross it, you want to inbreed it to itself and make sure there's nothing else that it can cross with, it takes some work. If you actually wanted to do that sort of thing, you should read Carol Depp's book, Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties. I'll put a link to Carol's book in the description below. But that's beyond the scope of this. Just know that if you've got, say, a seminal pumpkin and a butternut squash, the bees spread the pollen back and forth between the male and the female blooms, and you are going to get crosses. The actual dealing with the seeds on squashes and pumpkins is easy. Just take the guts out of a fully ripe one, just rinse it off in a colander, get all these gross guts out of it, and take these nice seeds. Any seeds that are like flat or misshapen or whatever, get rid of, but all these nice, well-rounded, healthy looking seeds, those will all grow you new plants. So just dry them inside, let them dry out to a reasonable level, and that's probably a couple of weeks sitting around, room temperature, then they're ready to get stored in the fridge. If you want to save butternuts, or if you want to save yellow crookneck, or whatever, plant only that species and don't plant anything like it close by, within a few hundred feet at least, and more so if you have bees. Now, for just casual seed saving, you don't have a seed company, it's all right, you're probably gonna be all right, but if you really, really wanna make sure you save the variety and it doesn't cross out, don't plant any other pepos. You're, you're gonna get weird mixes the next time around and you're not gonna get what you expect. Doesn't mean that it'll be bad, but it won't be the same thing you were saving seeds from. And it may not be great. You don't know, you've just introduced some risk. So these are considered an outbreeder. Unlike beans, they are gonna cross all over the place. Our next outbreeder is absolutely insane. And you definitely, definitely don't want it crossing. Corn is my favorite staple grain. It's easy to grow, easy to harvest. It makes a bunch of biomass for the compost pile. It comes in all kinds of beautiful varieties and you can turn it into grits. So, this is a grain corn right here called Hickory King. We grew a bunch of this early in the year. And these aren't the prettiest ears in the world because the squirrels ate the prettiest ears. And then something terrible, so sad, the squirrels fell out of the trees and died and ended up buried in one of the other gardens. But these are some of the ears we got left. We do have enough for a few good bowls of grits or to save some seeds. So for these guys, I'm gonna show you what we do to save the seeds. With corn, you let your corn dry on the plant. So the husks are turning brown and papery, and then you break them off. You wanna make sure that they have soaked in all the sugars that they're gonna get, and they've hit a good level of maturity on the plant. You can't pick them early like at sweet corn stage and expect that you're gonna get good seed out of it. So then, you let them go. You let them go until they're nice and dry inside. These have been sitting for over a month and now the kernels break easily, comparatively, out of the husks. They make tools to do this with. They're called your hands. Just break them off. Now, if I see any that look kind of weird and misshapen and ugly, those go to the chickens. And sometimes at the end, you might get some weird ones. So you just pick out the best ones. The rest of it goes to the chickens, or the compost pile, or your parakeet. And they just crack off of there. And when they get nice and dry, sometimes you can just run your hand over and break the whole thing off all at once. Now you gotta be careful with corn. If you only grew 20 corn plants, you're not going to have a good seed to use for next year. And that's because corn suffers greatly from inbreeding depression. 
that's when you get really upset because you found out you married a relative. So you should have at least 200 corn plants growing together if you're going to be saving seed because they're going to cross pollinate via wind. Corn is wind pollinated and it is a prolific outbreeder. That means if you're growing popcorn and you're growing dent corn and they're like, you know, 100 feet away from each other, if the wind is blowing across, it is going to cross and you'll end up with different colored kernels in there. You, it's really bad when you got wildly divergent varieties like sweet corn and popcorn and some of the kernels are like super sweet and they don't keep well and some of them are really hard and they'll break your teeth and it can be in the same ear. You don't want that. You want to grow at least 200 individuals, let them dry on the plant. Don't plant other corn anywhere nearby if you want to save a variety. If you want to breed your own variety of corn, super easy. You just plant like three or four or five or whatever different varieties, alternate the seeds all the way down the rows and let them interbreed for a few generations. You get some interesting stuff that way. So if these guys look bad, like I don't like that way some of those guys look, off to the chickens. But the rest of this, I had enough individuals that I can definitely save seed from these corn plants, but just barely. It would have been better if I had a quarter acre. So you get at least 200 plants, you let the ears dry on the plants, if possible. Then you bring them inside, you let them dry down further. Uh, they tend to get really wet here in the south, so I usually peel back the husks and let them dry, but I've seen other people just dry them in the husks. I want to make sure that the kernels are exposed to the air and they dry out quickly. Then you just let them sit room temperature, let them dry out in your house a month or so on the cob and then it's pretty easy to just crack them off of the cob. And if you were to save a sweet corn, it's the same thing. You don't pick them at the sweet corn stage. You're going to let them just sit there on the plant and they will actually give you the weirdest, strangest kind of shrivelly looking seeds. If you've planted sweet corn seeds, you know what I mean. They're all shrivelly and kind of strange looking. So that's the way you do it with corn and it's super easy. You just take a little bit of time and hopefully the squirrels don't get them all first. Our next crop is one of my favorites. Peppers. Now peppers are self-pollinators. That means if you have just one pepper plant you'll get peppers. You don't need to have other peppers around and a lot of cross-pollination doesn't necessarily take place, but a decent amount does. So if you were to grow, say, your bell peppers near your jalapenos, the next year you're pretty likely to get some crosses in between those. They may pollinate themselves or they may not. So if you've done like I did this year and grew a whole bunch of different peppers together, we could have crosses between multiple different types. We've got cayennes and habaneros and stuff and it's it's kind of complicated because there's multiple species inside them capsicum chinense and capsicum annuum and there's a few others and some of them cross more than others some of them hybridize some of them don't so saving pepper seed you will get peppers they definitely reproduce after their own kind but the cultivar is going to be unexpected in some cases so knowing that don't plant them too close to each other. Like if you wanted to save a variety of pepper that you really, really like, say there's a weary, weary, best tasting little pepper. Don't go planting that next to your, you know, chittle pin or whatever. Plant some of those peppers in the front yard, plant some of those peppers way in the backyard. And that way you're less likely to have bees going back and forth and crossing in between. They're much more likely to pollinate themselves. So these peppers right here, I have a little bag of them. A friend of mine saved these for me. He planted them in his garden and they ended up this thick fleshed, spicy, somewhat fruity flavored pepper. And he said, you might want to save some of these for future hot sauces. And I said, oh, that's a great idea. So I'm going to show you how to actually get the seeds out right now. For this operation, you want to have some gloves. Just get the cheap vinyl exam gloves or latex gloves or whatever 
because you know what happens with peppers. You can get punished by them for days. Get a little of the juice underneath your nails. Get some in your eye. It will happen. This is one of the few times you'll see me actually wearing gloves. Put your pepper, and we're gonna do an operation. Get yourself a sharp little paring knife or a razor blade or something. If you can remove the flesh part, the pepper's seeds are mostly in this core right here. And you just scrape these guys out. Now, you can float these in water, and the ones that float, you know are bad. But if you start with fully ripe peppers, you usually don't get too many of those. So you do it if you want to. For home gardening and not seed saving for a store, it doesn't matter all that much if you have a few duds, because you're probably just going to plant a whole tray of them later. But if you want to do the extra step of floating them in water, that's one way to do it. Just scrape them out of there. Now you have your seeds. Now dry these on a paper towel for a short period of time, like a couple of weeks, and they should be dried down enough inside of your house that you could store them in a jar or in an envelope, and stick them in your refrigerator. If you do them in an envelope, stick the envelope inside of a jar. You want something sealed. Or if you have a nice, cool, dry house, you could probably keep it in an envelope for a year and they would still sprout. In a tropical climate, the viability drops really, really fast on pretty much everything. But that's it. Just gut it. Now you can eat the rest of this pepper and you've got your seeds. There's enough seeds right there for, what, 30 plants or so. Pretty easy. Okra is super easy to save seeds from. Okra is super easy to save seeds from. The problem with okra is that it crosses. So, don't plant any crummy varieties of okra in your garden. If you want to save a variety, like, and make sure that it's perfect, 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 well, you'd better make sure that you only plant that one variety because the bees get around and they will spread okra from place to place and you will end up with some sort of weird cross. But if every variety in your garden is a good variety, like this burgundy might cross with the cow horn, well, they're both good varieties. I'm just not exactly gonna get the same okra next year. And eventually it will turn into my own farm variety of okra as they cross year after year after year. So if you have a variety that you really don't like, well, you probably don't want to plant an extra variety that you love. And you are only going to discover this the first year after it's too late. So if you've got a variety that's kind of been producing for you and it's producing poorly and it maybe it makes pods that are too hard too fast and nah, I don't really like them very much, chop all those down. Harvest all the pods that are currently on the variety that you really love and then Whatever pods develop after that are only going to be crosses from inside the type that you like. As for the actual seed saving part of it, carefully pick a mature pod off of your okra. Use a pair of nippers and just nip them off because there's a lot of fiber in it they're very hard to pull off. And when you see them like this, when they've turned brown and they're starting to crack open along the edges, that's how you know that that is ready. And then you just gotta crack it open. This one's been sitting in the house on the counter, break that pot open. And just let all the seeds out. They go in little rows all the way down. You let all the rows out, and now you have Cthulhu.
Sometimes seed saving takes a little bit of planning. In the case of these angle gourds, we eat these things regularly as they get bigger. And these are just babies right now, but in, a, in just a few days, they're going to be getting pretty big and it'll be time to eat them. So I wanna make sure that we save some angle gourd seeds for next year. So I bought the most obnoxiously pink flagging tape. This stuff costs like a buck or two a roll. And I will tie it on the vine. That means daddy set these aside. Don't harvest them. We're not eating these, these are for seed. You can go around to your bean plants, to your tomato plants, to individual fruits, if you've got a place to tie it on and say, okay, this one here is being dedicated for seed saving. It's important to do that with multiple plants, multiple fruits, so you get a good genetic variation. So just go around and mark a few on plants that look good, varieties that you wanna keep. Put a piece of flagging tape on there if you share your garden with other people and say, okay, look, if it's marked like that, that means something. That means don't pick those. We're not gonna eat those things. That's just the beginning of seed saving. Obviously, a lot goes into it, and different varieties have different characteristics and different ways you save their seeds. Storing seeds could be an entire different topic, like how heat and humidity decrease viability rapidly, but if it's cool and it's dry, it increases the viability. How if you freeze seeds and there's too much water in them, it just kills the seeds. There's all kinds of things that go into seed saving. And if you want like a simple overview of seed saving along with a bunch on propagating different plants, I wrote a book called Free Plants for Everyone. That is your crash course in growing plants from anything. If you wanna dive deep, deep into seed saving and look more at like professional techniques I highly recommend Suzanne Ashworth's book, Seed to Seed. If you wanna breed your own vegetable varieties, uh, you can't get any better than Carol Depp's book, Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties. So you can, you can learn about crossbreeding and all this kind of stuff. It, it's a very, very deep well. But for us backyard gardeners, what I showed you today is some of the basics of saving these summer vegetable seeds. And I hope that's helpful to you. Remember your inbreeding and your outbreeding and drying things down and saving them in the refrigerator, nice and dry and cool. These things will get you through with most seed varieties. And I appreciate you guys watching. I have a lot of fun doing these videos. Thank you to my cinematographer, Rachel, who is uh, my faithful companion in the garden. And I uh, appreciate you guys liking and subscribing and sharing the videos and everything. Thank you very much for that. Um, my Grocery Row Gardening book is coming out. It's in pre-order right now on Kindle only, but the paperback is coming and should be up in another week or two. If you want to help with the book bomb to make sure that it really takes off on Amazon, please do the Kindle pre-order and I'll put links to that below along with all the books that I talk about today. So get out in the garden, start saving some seeds, have fun, and until next time, may your thumbs always be green. I decided after talking to him, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put aside a bunch of stuff and I thought since I've been letting some stuff go to seed and preparing for the apocalypse, being prudent, not worried by the way, not worried at all, not worried at all, everything's fine, I figured I'd take you guys with me and show you how we save seeds. I don't think that worked, did it? Corn, 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 corn is my favorite staple grain.